if you let me, take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, the living breath of God to help us right now in this moment. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, in this moment, the body is gathered here. Every part and the sinews and the joints and the flesh and the blood. But Spirit, only you can breathe the breath of life into this body. Holy Spirit of the living God, here we come to the altar and the wood is laid out in order. But only you can bring the fire from heaven's altar. And so we invite you to come, Holy Spirit, and light this place for your glory, the beauty of your holiness. For Jesus' sake, amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17 is actually a, a sermon or an application of Isaiah chapter 35. So the first place I'm asking you to turn this morning is to Isaiah chapter 35. If you look in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms is really big, fat book in the middle of the Bible. Then if you go a couple of books to the right, you'll find the book of Isaiah. And I want to read together from Isaiah chapter 35. I want to read the whole chapter because this chapter is about holiness. And if we, if we ever think that God's way is narrow and it slows us down and it keeps us from joy, watch how this chapter describes holiness as a, as a wide light pathway where we can achieve maximum velocity toward joy. Look at how it describes God's holiness. Isaiah chapter 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad and the desert shall rejoice and blossom like a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then... The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame man shall leap like the deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. Waters will break forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they will not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up to it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy, not just joy, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy and all sorrow and all sighing shall flee away. This is a beautiful description of what it means to be holy. Some of us follow American Idol or the world of dance. Some of us follow the stock market. Some of us follow politics I follow, though it raises my blood pressure, I follow kind of the current state of evangelicalism 
and the Christian church in the West. You look at the key websites and ministries and what, they have, what they're talking about. If we could make a word cloud out of the key terms that you would have found in the last year on the top 10 sites of evangelicalism, what words would be biggest in that word cloud? Probably words like social justice, redeeming culture, human flourishing, cultural renewal, all stuff like that. But what if we went back 50 years? I know there was no internet then, but what if we could make a word cloud based on the words that evangelicals in the United States would have most often been using 50 years ago? I would hazard a guess that you wouldn't find a single one of those terms that I just mentioned but you might hear holiness, consecration, godliness, holiness. For me, I wanna recapture and elevate the beauty and the importance of holiness. What is holiness? If you look at verse eight of Isaiah 35, it says, and a highway shall be there and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. Probably the simplest or easiest way to define holiness is that holiness is the unclean isn't there. In other words, it's a simple move to define holiness negatively. Holiness is the absence of uncleanness or sin. But I'd rather define holiness positively not the absence of sin, but look at, what it, look at how holiness is defined positively. Verse 10, the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads and they shall obtain gladness and joy. Sorrow and sighing will be gone. Sin will be gone, but it's the presence of this everlasting joy. We speak about our bodies being healthy and our soul or our spirit being holy. And actually, you could do worse than the concept of healthy as a definition of holy. The same way that the body wants to be healthy, the spirit, the, 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 the heart, the soul wants to be healthy, wants to be holy. Now, how do you define health? If the only reason you wanna be healthy in your body, if the only reason you want to be healthy in your body is because uh, you don't want to have a disease, what is your life? Is the only reason you want to be healthy? The reason you want to be healthy is so that you can run, so that you can sing with a full set of lungs, so that you can grab the people you love and have a blast with them. That's why you want to be healthy. Holiness is not a restriction like I, I can't do all of these nasty, sinful things. Holiness is the establishment of a highway that we can run on to achieve maximum velocity in everlasting rejoicing. To be holy is to see God and love God and be transformed by God. Isaiah's context is the, he's making a prophecy about the coming kingdom that Jesus will bring when he returns. And when Jesus returns, it certainly says there, the unclean will be put, put away. But the first thing that it says is that the wilderness and the desert will become a blooming rose garden and the dry, dangerous place of the jackals shall become a lush oasis where everyone can dwell in the joy of a, 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 of the, of a feast and a celebration. To be holy is to be without sin and pollution, but it's more than that. It's to have in one's life the presence of God which brings the power of a joy that's indestructible. 
Holiness is not merely a list of behaviors that you don't do, though there are many and, and helpful lists of behaviors in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, that help us define the reality of holiness. But it's more than just a list of immoral behaviors to avoid. To be holy is to share in the, the holiness of God. To be holy is to walk with God, to continue in the blessed relationship with God. To be holy is to see God and to see God who is beautiful, to see God who is beautiful is in and of itself to be beautified by God, to be transformed in the joy of God's presence. There is a, I don't know if the right word for it is joy, let's call it pleasure. There's a pleasure in sin, moral misbehavior. The pleasure of sin is a pop and a fizz and then it's gone and you're left with the bitterness of regret. There's a joy in the presence of God. God, the Holy Spirit, is the spirit of joy. And it's as if that holy dove has no nest but the heart of the holy redeemed person. And when the Holy Spirit dwells within the heart of the redeemed, there is a radiance of joy and beauty because that person, that woman, that man is themselves being beautified by the presence of our holy God. Well, from Isaiah 35, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 because you'll see that Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 17 is itself kind of a, 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 a teaching or an application of Isaiah 35. We'll read the whole thing in a moment. Just land on verse 14, Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This is, I think, our key text. Strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Three questions. What is holiness? Second question, how do I pursue it? How do I strive for it? What is holiness and how do I strive for it? But the third question, perhaps most intriguingly, is what does the definition of holiness and how I strive for it have to do with seeing the Lord? Seeing the Lord. Strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Well, we're already trying to define holiness not merely as the absence of disease, but the presence of health and rejoicing in the Lord. Holiness is to obey God, but holiness is to walk with God in such a love relationship with God that his beautiful presence beautifies the, the saint who is becoming more like God. But what does this have to do with seeing God? Well, holiness helps you to see God and the unholiness in your life. It's like putting mud on your eyes where you can't see the beauty of God. And seeing the beauty of God is what transforms the soul, but when we throw the dust of unholiness into our eyes, it, it makes us unable to see God's beauty. The easiest way to say this, so a Amy and I didn't watch, won't watch, a pornographic show like the Game of Thrones. This is not because we are old-fashioned. This is not because we are puritanical and judgmental. This is because we believe that God is beautiful and we want to see him and it is unholiness that, that like clouds our vision, unbelief and seeing God. Well, if I could see God, I would believe in him. You know, I think we're kidding ourselves if we think our unbelief is because of, well, the age of the earth and logical scientific reasons for unbelief. Unbelief has moral and, 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 and affectional causes. And what happens is, we get used to immorality and with all of this immorality that we're engaging in, we're just plastering mud on the inside of our windshield. And then 
we look at that windshield and we're like, well, God says he's light. It sure doesn't look light in here. God must not be real. This is where it comes from. The windows are allowed to be covered with grime and then we doubt that the sun of God's love is shining. Seeing God. So Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 17. You hear Isaiah 35 in verse 12. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessings, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This passage about holiness begins with a therefore, and then I count eight commands. There's a trio, and then a pair of commands, and then a final trio of commands making eight all together. And both, each trio of commands has a so that or a purpose clause or a result clause attached to it. But I see the chief command as strive for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You see how it says there, it begins, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And verse 13, make straight paths for your feet so that you can walk on the highway of holiness. God's own hand makes the highway of holiness. The Bible talks about straight paths and the Bible talks about twisted paths. You know, the, um, the, the natural path, the way that water flows, always has so many twists and turns in it. To make a straight path requires uh, heavy equipment. Proverbs 2, you don't have to turn there. It says, these words are written to deliver you from the way of evil, from the way of perverse speech, from the men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in all their ways. You remember Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your pathway straight. To be on a straight path, that path has to be made. It has to be manufactured. The twisting, winding path is just the natural, easiest way to go. It takes heavy equipment and a lot of labor to make a straight path. If you don't believe that, just try to drive anywhere on I-94 right now. There's so many orange cones and heavy equipment. There's an article in the Journal Times day before yesterday, $17 million contract awarded to change KR and 11, right, where all that construction's going. This, is, this takes heavy equipment. You know, Hebrews 12, we just, we just talked about discipline for the last three or four weeks, the discipline of suffering. The argument here is discipline is God's heavy equipment by which he makes the straight path. So the question is, are you lazily, easily, just rolling on a worldly path? Or are you pursuing the straight path of God's holiness? It takes effort. That's why verse 12 says, lift up the drooping hands and strengthen the knocking knees. That's why verse 14 says, strive. That's a very strong word with agony. Strive for it. We could translate that word in verse 14, make every effort. Make every effort. Strive for peace and holiness. Think about striving and making every effort. One story of making every effort has always stuck with me. It's a story from the life of my historic hero, Winston S. Churchill. The S in Winston S. Churchill it stands for Spencer. I think his mom named him after me, but I haven't been able to verify it historically yet. But um, there, there's, uh, I read Martin Gilbert's biography uh, a couple times on Churchill's story, and there's this, when he was 18 years old, 
When he was 18 years old, he lost the watch that his father had given him while he was messing around in a pond. It was freezing cold. He was in the pond to prove how long he could stay in the freezing cold pond, but he lost his watch in there, and it was too cold to dive and look for the watch. And where any of us would be like, well, that watch is gone. The next day, Churchill, Winston Churchill, as an 18-year-old, found out that there was an attachment of 23 soldiers bordering their property. He, they had the day off. He took money out of his own pocket and hired this detachment of soldiers to, to dam up and reroute the stream that was filling the pond. And after they did that, he talked them into bringing the engine from their, whatever their artillery thing was, in and using that engine to drain the pond. And sure enough, then they found the watch that was at the bottom of the pond that evening. He made every effort to find that watch and then he found it. This is saying strive for holiness. If there is sin stuck in the swamp that is your life. What effort are you making to reroute the stream that is filling your life with that sin, to pump out the water and clean it up? He says, strive for it. The other strong word is there in verse, fif uh, verse 15, see to it. That's a, it's kind of a weak translation in the English. This word, uh, episcopontes, this word means look diligently. This word means uh, give, give serious supervision to this and look very carefully at it. I couldn't help but have this in mind. The other day I was, I, I don't know why, the other day I was watching my son and his friend watch Netflix and they each had their phone in their hand so, and then I'm looking over their shoulder. They're each doing like three things on their phone. There's a game going and then they, either they swipe to the side and then they're having a text with a friend and swipe to the side. They're on a social media thing. So there's three things going on their phone and they're watching Netflix and talking to each other about what's happening in the show. This is not to see to it. <laughs> to see to it means there is a singular focus with all of my attention riveted on this. See to it that you strive for holiness. Strive for peace and strive for holiness. Strive for peace because in a world like ours, with people like us, peace will not come naturally. Y'all are sweet, kind people, and so am I, thank you very much. But we still get on each other's nerves. Peace doesn't come naturally. So we have to strive for it. We have to fight for peace. It is not uncommon for one of our elders or one of our ABF leaders to mediate a conflict between two church members. And this is a great, good thing. I don't want to pretend there is no conflict between church members. I want to strive to work it out. This is what we have to do. Strive for peace, and then it says strive for holiness. Striving takes effort to look carefully to it, to walk with the Lord in the beauty of holiness, on the highway of holiness, that is, that is the liberty that comes to those who are watching how beautiful God is and being changed into his image. So I want you to look carefully and strive faithfully after holiness. But let me, let me tell you something. It's the, the most common thing to do is, how do I put this? Let's say you're going to strive carefully this week to not get hooked on heroin. Now, there may be two, there may be five or six people in here that that's actually an issue for you. And I don't mean to minimize that. We can help you with that. But for most of you, if you walk out of here thinking, I'm, I'm going to strive to not get hooked on heroin, this, this is not what this is talking about. For most of you, it may actually be your sort of pharisaical, proud attitude, like I'm not like one of those sinners, that is the, the very thing that is stopping the beautiful holiness of God in your life because God is opposed to the proud. 
So what is it that I'm asking you to work hard on and strive hard on and pump out that pond this week? Verse one, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. You locate the sin that clings so closely to you. Like I said, if that's heroin, then let us help you with that. But if it isn't, then d don't think you're okay because you don't sin like that sinner. There is still sin that is clinging closely to you. Locate it and strive to eliminate it. Let you in on a kind of an open secret about church life. It's pretty common. Phone rings. Hey, pastor. Why doesn't our church do more about this or that or the other thing? It's pretty common for the phone to ring. Hey, pastor, and this is heartbreaking. Can't you help my son, my daughter, my wife, my husband? I wish it wasn't so rare for the phone to ring and for the person on the other end of the line to say, hey, can you help me overcome my bosom sin that is afflicting me in my life? And can you help me now? This is what we're talking about. Now we're getting somewhere. Strive for overcoming your besetting sins. Now again, pastorally, and certainly this is clear from the book of Hebrews, we have to place this gospel command in a gospel context. Striving is the fruit that grows from a gospel root. We could say positional holiness and practical holiness. Striving for holiness is practical holiness, but positional holiness isn't something you strive for, it's something you strive from. Positional holiness is what Jesus gives you at the cross. This is, this is the glorious good news of Hebrews. Listen to how Hebrews 10, verse 10 says it. Hebrews 10 and verse 10. And by that will, we have been sanctified. Hebrews 10, 10. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. God counts you as perfectly sanctified. Who, me? Yes, you, if you are in Christ. Perfectly sanctified positionally. See the contrast, verse 11. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same old sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies would be a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. There's the practical holiness, this process of becoming in practice what Jesus has made me by his blood and by his resurrection. So we pursue this practically because Jesus has won it for us at the cross. We don't work for it. We work from it. Jesus gives us holiness as the gift of his grace. And now, as those who are beholding Jesus, we long to be changed and beautified into his holy likeness. Now let's look at the two warnings that come here in Hebrews 12. First is the warning of the root of bitterness and second is the warning of Esau. Verse 15 says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled. This is a quotation from Deuteronomy 29. So I'd ask you to turn back to Deuteronomy 29 so I can interpret this for you in its proper context. Deuteronomy 29, it's, it's one of the first books of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 29. And a, maybe a better translation instead of root of bitterness would be root of poison, a poisonous root. It says by it many will be defiled. It almost means by it many will die if they eat the fruit, this poisonous fruit. So if you're with me in Deuteronomy 29, we'll start in verse 18. Deuteronomy 29, beginning in verse 18. It says, beware lest there be. One little aside, and then I promise I'll just read the text. It says, beware. That's the first word, beware. It's a warning. It's a warning. 
If you come to this church, you will often hear warnings. There are only two ways to take a warning. Which way are you taking the warning? There's only two ways to take it. You hear a warning. And the first way to take that warning is to say, only stupid people would do that. I'm like halfway insulted that you would even warn me about that. Second way to take the warning. Oh, I want to make it. I want to last. And I'm so grateful to hear a warning about something that would keep me from making it. Watch. The person who thinks the warning is only for stupid people, in thinking she or he is too wise for the warning, that person is the stupidest, most foolish person in this place. And the person that has the other reaction who says, well, I'm prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Bind my heart with the fetters of your grace. The person who feels that, who feels her or his stupidity and folly, then becomes the wisest person in this room. This is the warning. This is the warning. You see it in verse 18. Beware. Lest there be among you a man or a woman, or a clan, or a tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go serve the gods of the nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. Verse 19, one who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. Here in the Old Testament, Old Covenant terminology of blessing and cursing, we have this individual who has heard the word of God. But he blesses his own heart and says, I know that God said that warning. I know that God warned about unholiness, but I'm going to be okay. I'm the exception. I'm going to go on in my own unholy way. And you see where this leads. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. It says that that poisonous root will, will, will cause many others to become defiled. This is why in the, sin, in the church, we, we, we deal with sin. If there's a member of the church who's in unrepentant sin, we go after them. And if they refuse to repent of their sin, according to 1 Corinthians 5, Titus 3, Matthew 18, we put that member out of the church. This is the Old Testament expression of that. Now back to Hebrews 12. And the last warning is Esau. And it's a little bit ticklish to interpret this. So let's see if we can figure it out briefly together. Esau, in verses 15 and 16, or verses 16 and 17, is uh, the foil to all of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. And you see what it says. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. You can read his story in Genesis 25 and 27. Esau was the firstborn son. He had the blessing of the promise of the firstborn. And because he was hungry, he sold his birthright for a meal. How does that relate to Hebrews? Esau gave up the promise in order to relieve his physical distress. The audience that received this book was in an exact position where they had the promise of Jesus Christ, but they had the earthly persecution of physical distress. And their decision was, you can give up the promise of Jesus Christ and maybe you won't get sent to jail. You can give up the promise of Jesus Christ and maybe you won't lose your job and all your possessions. 
And he's saying, don't give up the promise of God in Jesus Christ. Don't do it. You were given something precious in the gospel. Do not forsake it and give it up for physical pleasures. There, you were given something so precious in the gospel. Don't give it up to stay popular in this present age. Listen, there is nothing more fickle than the crowd and what is and isn't popular in this present age. And there is nothing more foundationally real than the promise of God in the Lord Jesus Christ for this age and the age to come. It says Esau was sexually immoral. There is nothing more effervescent and passing than the pleasures of sexual sin. And there is nothing more certain and everlasting than the promise of joy in Jesus Christ for those who see the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Esau is called, verse 16, unholy or godless. In verse 16, Esau is called unholy. Why? Because he allowed his personal appetites to guide his behavior. A man becomes unholy and godless when his God is his belly and his hormones. He is godless because his own personal appetites are now driving him. To be holy is to have the beauty and the, the glory and the love of God guide me in all that I do. Now, a quick comment about verse 17. It, verse 17 isn't supposed to be saying, if you really want to repent of your sin, God's not going to let you repent of your sin and he's going to cast you out. If you read that verse carefully, it says Esau desi desired to get back the blessing. <laughs> Esau was not repentant over who he was and what he had done. Esau was sad about what he had lost. And so he tried to get back his birthright, but he couldn't get it back. This is a warning to say, if all you can see is the earthly consequence of your sin, you're not going to make it. You better dive into real repentance. And Jesus says, the one who comes to me in real repentance, I'll never cast that one away. So if we've tracked through these verses and the Old Testament equivalent of what they lead to, let me give you just very briefly, if you're here and you're like, yes, I want to pursue holiness, let me give you three ways that you can pursue holiness. And these just came this week as I, as I got done here and I got done studying and I closed my eyes, not to sleep, but I closed my eyes, leaned back in my chair, and I just thought this question. In the last 18 years that I've been here, there have been a lot of people that came to talk to me about getting rid of sin in their life, and they didn't do it. They didn't follow through. They didn't make it. And there have also been a lot of people who have come to me and said, help me overcome the sin in my life, and they have done it. They made it. What's the difference? I would put the difference in these three things. The, those in the first category didn't really chase these three things all the way through. And those in the second category, they did. It won't take long to cover. Accept full responsibility. Apply full resources. Always adore Jesus. Accept full responsibility. Apply full resources. And third, always adore Jesus. The first one, accept full responsibility. Accept full responsibility. That is, where there's sin and unholiness in my life, I have to confess that sin. No evasions, no excuses, no but compared to, but that, this, is, this is that reason. Accept full responsibility with integrity. Listen, 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. You know what? I want to see more Christians who are faithful and just to actually confess their sin. No weasel words, no excuses. This is my sin. God, if you want to slay me, you can slay me because I'm the man, I've done it, here it is. Be faithful with integrity to accept full responsibility for your sin. 
That's first. Second, apply full resources. God has given us many resources to battle our sin. I can name you five. I'll name them so quick that you'll be mad at me, but I'll just name them anyways. The word, prayer, accountability, changes or barriers, actual changes, actual barriers, and then fifth is replacement. I'll go through them again and just say a word about each. Five resources, apply full resources. First, the word. Oh, man. Memorize the word. Meditate on the word. Sit under the preaching of the word. Apply the word of God to your struggles with sin. Second, prayer. I don't think there's anything we give up on quicker than prayer. I don't think there's anything more powerful. You want to you overcome something? Then you pray with fasting. You show by your earthly hunger how, how your soul longs to receive this. And if you have a friend who will fast and pray for you, that is a friend who is closer than a brother. The word, prayer, third, accountability, real honest relationships where you can walk with people who have been there and they can help you. Fourth is changes and barriers. This is like the metaphorical saying of Jesus, if your right eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. This is what the apostle says in Romans 13, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. If you have to get rid of your smartphone, get rid of your smartphone. And it's better to go to heaven with a rotary phone than to go to hell with the latest iPhone. Just, if you have to put barriers in your life, do it. And then fifth is replacement. And by that I mean like, There's a place in Ephesians where Paul says to a thief, don't steal any longer, but instead work with your hands and make enough that you can give to those who have need. Replace your sin with something else. Accept full responsibility, apply full resources, and then third, we're back to that first question. What does striving for holiness have to do with seeing the Lord? The third is always adore Jesus. I'm telling you, the people that make it are the people that apply this truism for every one look at self. Take 10 looks at Christ. Even when you're in the middle of really confessing your sin, don't get stuck in the morass of self-analysis and self-reflection. Genuinely confess your sin by looking at the sinless one. Rivet your soul's attention on Jesus. I'm calling you to strive for holiness, and I'm just telling you, 18 ways to Sunday, it is not your striving efforts that'll get you there. It's Jesus who will get you there. He'll carry you there on his back. All you must do is look to him. God is holy. I'm going to say the exact same thing. God is beautiful. Those are equivalent statements. And when we gaze on the beauty of Christ, the soul's look at Christ beautifies the soul by the presence of the Holy Spirit of Christ within the affections of the growing Christian. The highway of holiness is a highway of everlasting joy where we can run with maximum velocity into the beauty of belonging in the presence of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, this is our request. Help us see you. Lord Jesus, this is our request. Make us see you. Lord Jesus, I confess in all honesty, when I don't look at you, sin looks good. Jesus, when I see you, it reveals the ugliness and the horror of sin. Lord Jesus, let us see you. Even as we confess our sin, let us not get stuck in a confession 
that's just a mirror looking inward and inward and inward. Let us look upward to the bleeding Savior whose blood took our sin away. Let us look upward to the risen, ascended Savior who will return and make the highway of holiness. Lord Jesus, let us see you. And as we see you, transform us into the glory of the beauty of your holiness. This is our prayer in the name of our risen Savior. Amen. Now, church, here's the benediction, these words from the prophet Isaiah. Say to those, say to those right here who have an anxious heart, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, and he will come, and he will save you. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be on their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and all sorrow and all sighing shall flee away. Amen. Thank you.